Welcome to Drink Beer, Think Beer, the podcast that gets to the bottom of every pint. I'm John Hall. This week I'm talking with Drew Fox of 18th Street Brewery in Indiana, and I'll get into it in a moment. But first, a reminder to check out BeerEdge.com for articles, to sign up for our newsletter, and to catch up with episodes of the Beer Edge podcast hosted by Andy Crouch. And please visit us on all of the social medias at The Beer Edge. And if you're curious about advertising on this show, it's surprisingly affordable. You can reach out to Liz Melby. She's at Liz at BeerEdge.com, and she can get you all the information that you need. And I will also politely ask that if you haven't left a review of this show on your podcast platform, form of choice, particularly if you like the show, please do so. It does help other folks find the show. I've been wanting to get Drew Fox on this program for a while now. I've been admiring his brewery from afar, and on the occasions that I've had his brewery's beer, I've often reached for a second pint. A decade ago, he decided to take his homebrewing hobby and go pro. And since then, he's grown the business into multiple locations, into bigger brewing systems, and has traveled the country and the world doing collaboration beers and generally being a force for goodwill in the brewing industry. This is another one of those interviews that now that I'm recording this and I've just completed it, I would have loved to have done it in person. But since the pandemic is still with us, the phone had to do. Still, that doesn't prevent us from talking about some of the most important issues in beer today, chief among them mental health. From recipe evolution to creation and what he's choosing to focus on to help the brewery grow in a meaningful way, this is an interview that's going to stick with me for a while, and I hope you feel the same way. Drew spoke to me from Indiana, and I started off by asking him to go back in time a bit. Here's our conversation. When you founded 18th Street, when you went from being a home brewer to starting a professional brewery, which is going on nine years now, eight years now, it's, um, it's 10 years for me since I founded the company, but it's uh, eight years since the, uh, the first brew pub opened. When you were getting ready to open the doors, what, what did you want the brewery to, to be? What did you want the brewery to represent as far as your you know, brewing philosophy? And have you been able to maintain that or has it, has it changed from what your initial intent was? Really, my initial intent was to open a brewery uh, in Gary, Indiana, and really show people that uh, it wasn't just going to be a fly-by-night operation. It just wasn't going to be a pipe dream. Um, And really not gaining support early on, really a lot of no-vote confidence from, you know, just a lot of folks. What what do you mean by that? Like you know, who, who has given you hard times? It, it was really, you know, uh, you know, um, you know, a few of my friends, family and a few uh, brewery folks. Uh, and certainly, the, you know, uh, at that time, the uh, Gary administration who really didn't understand what a, a brewery or a brew pub was. So, um, you know, people, you know, were saying, why are you putting a brewery in Gary? You should put a brewery in Chicago. You're born and raised in Chicago. You, you know, you, from, you, you live in Chicago, you know, partially true. Uh, but I also lived in Gary at that time. So uh, and I, and I felt it was important for me to really set the tone that, you know, Gary is just not the bad rap, you know, murder capital of the world, et cetera, et cetera. Well, no, Camden, uh, New Jersey took that over a couple of years ago. So, um, yeah. you know, Jersey pride. Um, yeah. Uh, we're number one in something. Yeah, same, you know, but I, I really wanted to just really be the best brewery in the world that we and put out some really cool and unusual beers. Um, and at that time, you know, the only game in town was, uh, you know, Three Floyds, who was just crushing and killing it. So, um, and I knew that, you know, that we could potentially do the same thing if we had the right business model and, and the right beers in place. Um, it's, it's, have we kept to that? Yes. Uh, and, you know, we've always surrounded ourselves around our community, um, you know, whether it be Hammond, Gary, or Indianapolis. Um, that's always important for me. Um, and, you know, our breweries could be in a showcase, I mean, a showcase you know, high in location, but that's just not who I am or how we founded this company. Um, you know, we're glitz and glamour. We're, we're all about the grit. We're all about the hard work, um, you know, placing ourselves in really nondescript, uh, really tough areas 
for business to thrive in. And so we've, um, you know, for the most part, we kept to that um, and really haven't changed our business model uh, as much at all. What I find interesting about that is, and I, I've you know spent time in Gary, I've spent time in Hammond, um, back in my reporter days, and you know it's I go in for some really terrible things that happened in the world, and you know then I'd get out because that was just the nature of the job. Um, but when I've talked to other brewers over time who have you know moved into areas where there aren't breweries, um, but there's affordable real estate, um. There isn't necessarily the pushback uh, that you sort of seem to to intimate was was happening from folks uh, that you know or government officials, um, and there's also sort of promise of the of the area as well. Um, you know, so if if on a scale of ten, they were maybe starting at like a three or four, it almost right. seems like you were starting at a one or even less. Right. I mean, it was a lot of educating that I had to do. Um, you know, population in Gary is 95% African American, and you break the rest of that down between Latino, Caucasian, um, and etc. So, um, and it was important for me to do that because at the end of the day, in order for me to succeed, I still needed uh, the city, the city to rally around and support me. Um, you know, to get through council, to get through all the votes, I needed to, you know, just get a damn permit. So. Um, I learned a lot in that process, and I've always shared that with other breweries who are going into smaller towns um, and who have some sort of some of the same challenges, uh, because obviously, you know, state or local and tip financing that 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 doesn't exist. So you're pretty much kind of, um, you know, starting up from scratch and 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 looking for ways to introduce folks to your product. I mean, I, I'm I'm thinking like as people are. You know, Gary has always been on the way to Chicago or Indianapolis, as it were. You know, it's you're, you're doing what, 65 to 64, 65. Yeah, to, 65, yep, yeah, 65 north and then, you know, sort of up to 90 and, and, and going from there or vice versa. Um, so getting people to stop in Gary, especially when you're that close to Chicago, I think is has always sort of been a difficult thing for the city. Um, and so in relying on the locals relying on the residents themselves. Where did you start with outreach? It was really, um, you know, I, when I started my career, I was working at, uh, at Piper's Brewing Company in Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, so I met a lot of um, folks um, who were either transplants from Gary, um, who really wanted to see us uh, succeed in Gary. Uh, and really just, I engaged myself in conversation you know, with breweries that I respected, breweries that uh, wanted to support, kind of, you know, backdoor support, not saying, hey, here's, you know, some money or parts, but we don't want to know that we did that for you because then we got to help everyone else out. Um, so that was the key. And really um, just talking to the right people and, and really understanding my demographic. Um, I met with some key folks uh, in Gary at the time, there was two young lawyers, or well, one one young lawyer and one young um, uh, a commission develop uh, commissioner who was on development. Mm -hmm. um, and they reached out and said, "Hey, man, we we saw what you're trying to do. We want to help." So a lot of people through them jumped on board uh, and just were kind of the mouthpiece for us. But a lot of it was really just pounding the pavement, meeting and greeting people in mm -hmm. cafes you know, restaurants, uh, parks, dark alleys, and just, just, trying, to get stuff, <laughs> just, just trying to get stuff done um, and really working through the, the administration to get, you know, access to the mayor and, and kind of talk about my plans and, and what I wanted to do. When I think about even a decade ago and how much the beer industry has changed in the U.S., mm -hmm. opening up with the brew pub as opposed to just the taproom model that you know, most folks do today. Mm -hmm. Was that an advantage? Is that something that if you could do it all over again, you'd still have the brew pub component? Um, if I did it all over again, I, I would not have the brew pub component. Originally, um, you know, we were just going to basically do production um, and self-distro, which is what I was used to at, um, uh, at Pipeworks. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I, I had went down to Sun King, was probably in uh, 2012 and yep. met with the owners there, Clay and Dave. Great guys. And yeah. yeah um, and kind of told them what my plan was. And they're like, uh, you're stupid. Why would you, why would you not want to have a tap room and sell beer? You know, it's 99% profit. You, you probably want to do that. Uh, and then the brew pub, the food component came um, probably eight months after when uh, our good friends, Miller pizza really was just getting pounded by our, 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 you know, our staff and our customers, they couldn't keep up. And so they had to hire new people. So um, we had a small closet that we turned into a makeshift kitchen. Um, you know, I come from food and, and uh, food and beverage hospitality, you know, all my life, you know, you know, going on, you know, 30 years. Um, but I would never put a food component uh, in, in any of our establishments ever again. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's low margin. It's high stress. It's high turnover. Uh, and anyone who asked me, hey, um, I want to open a kitchen. Um, and I just tell them, I'm like, you don't want to open a kitchen. Trust me. Um, I was talking to Jeff Stuffings, uh, in Denmark, uh, two years ago. Uh, and he said, Hey, man, I'm thinking about putting a kitchen in. And I said, haven't you learned anything from me about putting in <laughs> kitchens in the fruit pub? And I saw him recently, uh, last year and I go, how's that kitchen going? His wife was like, terrible, terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't know. It's it, sort of it, a necessity, though, for for him at Jester King, just because there's absolutely. nothing and else around. Right. And yeah. they've done a great job. I mean, the with food it. trucks like lose money on gas just driving all just the way out down there. there. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, I I think you know she again. It's it's a stressful part of the operation, uh, and I know that all too well. Um, and for us, it was sort of a necessity because there's really only two restaurants in our neighborhood in Miller beach at the time. And, um, and I came from a very high end food background. So, um, I wanted to kind of showcase a little bit of that, but kind of pub there, but it's always been our vice. Um, I still love it. Um, and it's always, you know, been the, the challenge it's, it's been, you know, rough doing it, but we do it extremely well. Um, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it again. When you were a home brewer and you started thinking about going pro, there, there's usually that one recipe that home brewers will hang their hat on and say, okay, like this is going to be my flagship. This is going to be the one that I become known for uh, or that I want to become known for once I get a professional brewing license and I open up my own place. Was there a beer like that for you? Um, It wasn't just one beer. It was really four beers, um, you know, through my research and conversations with other professional brewers, they're like, you know, you want to come out with at least four solid core beers um, that would really set the tone and, you know, kind of punch or wake up your competition in the area to say, oh, holy cow, this is what they're doing. So it was four beers for me. It was Hunter. It was Deal with the Devil, uh, Sex and Candy. Uh, and then, you know, if you want to throw in there, I don't, I don't know if we even did this beer around around that time. Um, you know, this, it was probably Rise of the Angels, kind of our West Coast style riff on like, um, you know, planning. Um, those are the four core beers, you know, that I, that I really think of uh, that really helps the tone for us. But were these ones that you were homebrewing? No, I know, but like, but that you felt like also passionate about, or was this yep. sort of a means to an end of like, okay, if I can get these four, cause this is the advice that I'm getting, I'll be in good shape or like, no. were you, yeah. They're, they're all, again, we, I, I worked tirelessly on the recipes and tweaked them and changed them uh, because I really wanted the beer to be amazing and, and really set the tone for who we were um, and kind of drive, drive home that we're just not, some professional, you know, uh, we're not just not some home brewer trying to turn pro and be professional. So the beers really had to speak to our culture, um, but more importantly, that had to have some legs and longevity for people to really um, stick out and uh, kind of help build um, the company uh, moving forward. Um, 
obviously there's been an evolution now because you have a, a Pilsner, you have you know, lactose IPAs, you have, you know, you, you're hitting all of the the modern buttons. Um, where do the original four still stand? Yeah, the original four right now, I say Hunter is still uh, one of our flagship beers. Uh, Sex and Candy, it's 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 our baby, uh, and Deal with the Devil, is, you know, it's you know for us we brew that every now and then um, to get people excited about it. Um, it's not really a key driver for us, um, and obviously um, Best Patio Pills is it's everywhere. You know, it's it's one of our biggest drivers even till this day. Um, you know, big box stores such as Walmart and whether it be Kroger, etc. Um, it's th- those beers are kind of leading the charge for us, you know, which, which, you know, I, I, I know I spend a lot of time talking about lagers and pilsners on this show, but when I think back 10 years now, you know, to no, be talking with a small brewer about, you know, their pilsner in Kroger, you know, is just, <laughs> it gets hard not knowing. to laugh. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, I, I, you know, for, for us, you know, we would, go drink someone else's Pilsner and Lager. We have a brewery in town. He makes great Pilsners and Lagers in Hollis. He actually helped us kind of create our recipe. Um, and we were mind blown by his passion um, towards that style of beer. But through my travels, you know, whether it be in, in Denmark or Japan, um, someone was making a killer Pilsner um, or a Keller beer. Uh, and we're just like, I came home every time at their trip. I'm like, we're making a goddamn Pilsner. I don't care what you guys say. <laughs> we're making a goddamn Pilsner. And our head brewer, Rich Mendoza, was like, about damn time, you know, so. <laughs> so they were waiting uh, on you to get get around to it. You're walking in with yeah. this great idea, like, hey, hey, guys. Uh, and they're just, they've been waiting on you. I like that. Absolutely. And that beer has changed because originally I really wanted that beer to be unfiltered, kind of similar to a Keller beer. Um, and we we're using, I think we were in, me and my wife were in the Czech Republic and I had Bud Bar for the first time. Um, my good friend, uh, Nick Foy is a good friend of mine. And I said, Hey Nick, where should I go? Should I go to Pilsner or Kel? Or sh- what should I do? He's like, no, wherever you go, stop and have a Bud Bar. And I was like, really? He's like, yeah, it's mind blowing. And, um, he's not wrong. Yeah. So we went to a small, uh, a small tap room right across the Charles Street Bridge and had a Bud Bar in this place. Well, I had a poster that was using Bud Bar yeast and mind blown. Um, and I just remember asking the brewer, I'm like, what yeast are you using? He's like, Bud Bar, Bud Bar. And so I came home and uh, we we used Bud Bar and did a Keller beer and it was just mind blowing. So um, and then Rich decided he wanted to change it and use a Pilsner yeast, but whatever, that's a whole different story. <laughs> <laughs> There's, I'm trying to think of the right way to, to, to back into this now because I miss travel a lot and I miss mm. drinking these iconic local beers where they're made. Um, and where they are such an ingrained part of the fabric. And, you know, you mentioned Pliny earlier. There's something special about being in Northern California and drinking that beer. You know, there's something special, um, you know, about going to, to, to various parts of the country and drinking you know, beer that you can't get in other places. Um, but when you're thinking about these mind-blowing experiences, how can you offer that to the people who drink your beer these days? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, you know, first and foremost, the beer has to be exceptional. Um, and we pride ourselves on doing that. We try to, try to you know, put the best beer in cans or in kegs. Two, uh, the story behind the actual product that you're producing goes a long way still in my mind with people and, and consumers. They want to know where it's coming from. They want to know how it's been created. Um and, and so you have to educate your staff and the people that work with you uh, to share that knowledge with the consumer. Uh, more importantly, uh, we look at making sure, and this is something that, you know, we looked at before the pandemic, um, is we should be more local than, than we are. Um, 
I was always a big huh. proponent of staying, staying local and not going out of state um, because I wanted to grow my brand in the state and own our territories and own the market before we did that. Well, that was the uh, Sun King model early on as well. Yeah. And uh, I don't think we did a good job of that. I thought we did a good job in the beginning, uh, but when we started leaving our territory, um, you know, I became disheartened with that. Since you know, I, I don't think we should be stepping out of bounds, um, selling beer in, you know, New York or Boston or wherever just because they want it. Um, and so, you know, year before last, um, we decided to really make a bigger push in staying at home and keeping our our beer home and keeping it local get to know our distribution partners, get to know all the bar owners that we work with. Um, and when we were self destroying our beer, we, we had that down pat. And so we kind of went away from that into a distribution model, um, which I, my personal opinion, depending on the distribution partner, we have some great ones that still do a great job for us. And we had some pretty terrible ones that really hurt our brand and hurt us. Um, so keeping those things home in my mind is how you continue to be relevant uh, and drive your brand and, and drive uh, the consumer towards your brand. But then also building on that sort of wow factor experience of being yep. in the Czech Republic and, you know, or being in Northern California or being, yeah. You know, those, you know, those are always a learning, learning experiences for me that I get a chance to bring home. Uh, and as I said, I travel a lot, you know, at our peak, you know, 90 to 105, 125 days a year was a lot. Um, and it was a lot of knowledge being brought back. And it was a lot of, um, you know, you know, looking at how we do things and how can we get better. Um, and if you look at Czech Republic, everyone's drinking what's local. It's either going to be Pilsner or Cal, it's going to be Bud Bar mm -hmm. or some local uh, brewery in the area. And you may find a few small out-of-state products, um, but it's all local and people know that. Um, and it, I was kind of enamored by that. And, and it says, hey, we should be doing the same thing. It, we should keep it home. Um, and everyone in the state should know who we are. And we need to build upon that before we, again, step outside of the box. I'm trying to think of the right way of... <laughs> Say it. <laughs> no, 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 there, 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 no. There's, there, there's like a thousand things that you just said that I'm trying to un, un, unpack, like in all of that. And, and I guess, has this time at home really given you a, 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 a better opportunity for, for more clarity? I, I was thinking of a conversation I had with a Chicago land brewer uh, at the early part of the pandemic, who was also on the road 80, 90 days a year, if not more. And every weekend was jetting off to a collaboration or doing something. And he had a chance to be home for three or four months and was realizing all of the work that needed to be done at home, you know, uh, like inside of his four walls of the brewery. Um, do you think that the pandemic, you were obviously thinking about some of the stuff before that, but has the pandemic made any of those realizations any more clear or created new realizations for what the brewery can be? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, keeping, sorry, I mean, it took I, me a minute I, to get there, but no, yeah. no, no, that's, yeah, that's fine. I, 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 you know, just for your audience, I, uh, I don't think people know, but you know, I'm responsible for 18th street brewery, 18th street distillery, you know, the Sour Note Brewing, which is our sour facility. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we have four pubs. So, you know, I was, you know, so, you know, I'm, you know, I'm the head distiller. So, and I'm on brewery operations with Rich. So, and, you know, I'm in recipe formulation and sour brew. So there's a lot of things that I had my hands in um, and a lot of things that I really wanted to kind of divest myself from to focus on things that were important. Um, you know, and so what I mean by that is, so, you know, I, I thought we've done a great job and amazing job building the brewery, um, you know, going on, you know, eight years and me spending 10 years of my life building the brewery. Um, and, you know, we started the distillery in 2017 um, and it's taking off. It's doing extremely well. And I really have an emotional attachment to the distillery um, because it's something that I really want to do for a lot of years. And I felt bad 
in so many ways that I wasn't dedicating 110% of my time to the distillery mm -hmm. and helping build that brand um, and building it to what it should be. The same thing with the Sour Brewery. Um, so it's given me a lot of time to really think about uh, 18th Street Brewery is doing, is doing well. Uh, we we spent a lot of time building that brand. Um, you know, is it the right time for me to, um, you know, 100% hand that over to Richard Hedberg and, um, you know, Ed McKernan, who's our CEO, um, and, you know, maintain my role as president of the company and, and step aside and let that continue to build and grow while I focus on the distillery and putting – 100% of my attention into building the distillery over the next, you know, 10 years or eight years and getting it to where we need it to be. So, yeah, it, it's, it's a lot of self-reflection. It's a lot of uh, giving me the opportunity to think about how we run our companies as, as a whole. Um, but in general, um, you know, it's also given me the opportunity to say, I want to be a better, uh, a better owner. I want to be a better uh, educator, you know, I want to be a better philanthropist. Um, it, it's given me a lot of time to really just prioritize not the 12 things were on my plate, but really some targeted uh, goals, um, you know, for the next few years. Uh, and there's you know, basically three targeted goals I want to focus on uh, for the next, you know, several years. And, and that's it, not the 12 or 13 I've had on my plate for the last eight years. Um, you, mess you mentioned um, uh, philanthropic efforts. Uh, yeah. That's something that you know gets talked about um, a little bit in, in in the beer world, although not certainly enough because you know there's there's obviously uh, things that people are are, are passionate about. Um, where do your interests lie in that arena? You know, we have several, um, and I won't go into great detail. Um, you know, but we do support a lot of um, projects and causes that we believe in. Um, you know, one is. Um, Right in Hammond, it's it's a uh, battered women's shelter that we we wholeheartedly support. Um, you know, and the you know the others, you know, mental health. Um, you know, I'm a you know I'm a suicide survivor, and um, so I, I really feel that I have not done enough uh, in that area. It's it's led to a lot of conversation in the last couple of years. Um, so uh, putting more effort into that side of, uh, which is one of my goals is, uh, helping promote small mental health entities or projects, uh, that me and my wife believe in. Um, so we really want to get out and do a lot more of that this year. Mental health is, we, we've spent some time talking about it on the show, although certainly not, not enough. Um, it seems to be, acute in the brewing industry and in and around and whether it's the presence of alcohol or high stress or any number of things. Um, when you're talking with other folks in the industry, um, what are you looking out for? You know, cause it's, you know, you, you obviously have a unique perspective on this and mm -hmm. you know, there may be people listening who, are working in and around other folks who might be going through something, but they haven't necessarily seen the signs or the, the signs haven't made themselves you know, abundantly clear. Um, mm -hmm. What do you look for as warning signs to help people, you know, with the help they need? Yeah. I, I, you know, for me, um, you know, it, 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 it was really, not recognizing or wanting to realize that, you know, depression um, and uh, loneliness um, had taken over, you know, 85% of my life. Uh, you know, even though I'm out there every day and, and in front of, you know, meeting, greeting customers, working with my staff and, you know, working with our executive team and working with some of the best breweries in the world, um, no one realize or recognize that I was struggling. More importantly, um, I didn't want to tell anyone uh, uh, what I was dealing with. It was very, in my mind, very embarrassing. Uh, I'm in an industry where the African-American population of ownership 
for breweries is, is very small. And, yeah. and even in our, and even in our state, in our state, I'm the first African American brewery owner and African American distillery owner in our state. And so there's a lot of pressure, a lot of things that I'm, that I, I'm responsible for. And, and I take great pride in that. Um, you know, for me, it's, it's really looking at the signs of someone who may have excessive drinking, um, who, uh, is, uh, you know, angry or quick to, um, you know, jump down someone's throat, um, you know, more importantly, who just kind of shuts down after the work hours and kind of huddles in the corner and, and, and just, it stirs off into a different world. You know, those those were some of the things that, you know, that I know for a fact that were, uh, some of the things that I dealt with. Um, and so those are some of the things I look for. And, and, and sometimes you, you just, you get blindsided by, you just don't know, you didn't know. I'm a person who was struggling with, you know, certain situations. So, um, and, you know, uh, and I also attribute, you know, the industry for saving my life. Um, you know, two of my best friends in the industry, you know, John Buford and Pat Weir from Arizona and Wilderness Brewing. Yeah. Um, if it hadn't been for them, I, you know, my fiance at the time, now wife, would have walked home and, uh, you know, found me. You know, not on this earth anymore. So, um, you know, but also you, you can't be embarrassed to ask for help. Our industry is very, um, I wouldn't say secretive, but we protect each other in a way where uh, we don't want people to know that we're struggling. And and sometimes, um, depending on who you surround yourself around, those are great uh, people who can help you uh, not uh you know, no one wants to know that it's, this is being made public because I, I think there's some repercussions behind that as well. Um, so, uh, you know, when I started talking about it a couple of years ago, I only told, you know, really some really close friends of mine. Um, and then just as of recently, um, we did a beer with Hope for a Day. And I was, okay, I'm, I got to talk about this because now. Can you talk about I'm Hope for a Day? I'm sorry? Can you talk about Hope for a Day? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, they reached out um, to us um, and wanting to do a beer um, that was solely around mental health. Um, and uh, they didn't know uh, I was a suicide survivor, but they they were talking about what was happening in the industry and the coffee industry and the beer industry, restaurant industry as a whole, uh, you know, and it, it's, it's, it's a cycle. It's a vicious cycle. And, um, and so they wanted to do a beer that really talked about, hey, it's it's OK not to be OK. And yeah, um, which kind of led me to really just come out of the closet and kind of tell my story a little bit. Um, and so we did this amazing, you know, fruited sour. And um, it was hope for a day, folks. Uh, chef Brian Fisher who's a, an amazing uh, chef in Chicago. Um, and we just all stood around and talked about uh, what we want to accomplish with this beer. But lo and behold, it we had a member of our team come forward and said, Hey, I'm struggling, you know, with this disease uh, and I'm happy you came forward and talked about it. And so, um, and, and was looking for a mentor and looking for someone to help him, you know, get through um, the rest of his day and months and years. So uh, I'm happy we did it. Um, again, uh, we, we want to do more of that philanthropic stuff that, Again, we're not out for publicity. Um, yeah. Stuff that we do, we don't talk about, but it, it's near and dear to us. Since I think, again, that's one of the big things uh, on, on my points list we want to focus on this year. I appreciate you sharing that part of your life with us, and you know, it serves, I think, as a great reminder to anybody who's listening that, you know, as you said, it's it's okay to not be okay, um, and you know, there's a lot of folks who you know, are ready to listen, ready to help and, you know, certainly available for anybody who needs it. So, um, yep. Yep. you know, just take that step. It's better than the alternative for sure. Um, Absolutely. Uh, well, uh, that got, you know, necessarily <laughs> heavy. Um, I kind of want to draw it back to beer if that's okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, absolutely. As, sure, sure. As you're thinking about 
what comes next for the evolution of the beers that you're making. Um, if you're thinking about the next 10 years, and it sounds like you're going to be off in the distillery world anyway, but you know, if, 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 if you're thinking about, you know, beers in the next 10 years, where would you like to see 18th Street's offerings evolve to? For, for us, you know, we're a big IPA pale stout driven house. Um, I want to make some really um, old world classics um, that I think excite me um, when I was a early beer nerd um, drinking these beers. I, you know, I, I still get geeked about uh, certain beers. Um, like that give, give I, us some styles. Give us some names. <laughs> uh, you know, like a, you know, like a Bach. Um, okay. A robust, a robust porter, um, like an actual you know, porter. Yeah. Yeah, an actual porter, not a know, black eye. Four and a half. Yeah. yeah, a four and a half, five percenter. Um, you know, in the an amazing Keller beer. Um, that I, I, I think that, you know, that drives palate to to just not be a one dimensional, um, uh, a one dimensional note when you drink it, but that has every characteristic of the grain, the actual yeast, um, you know, uh, to me, that is what I want us to look forward to the future. Um, you know, a short spear, my wife loves short spears. I'm like, I don't get it, but <laughs> I, I, when I see one on the menu, I'm like, all right, I'm going to go run and get that beer because um, she loves them. So, uh, you know, the evolution is getting away from, you know, making really cool, dope, west coast style ipa um and getting away from lactose i mean in my mind they're, they're great for certain things um and over the years um are they great in beer i mean i'm i'm not gonna knock or judge but they they're great for beer sales for sure um but i i think some old school classics you know that i like to see us get more in the mix and, and you know we're starting to do that right now um you know, we you we went from a three and a half barrel system to, you know, fifteen, um, then a thirty barrel brew house. So it it it's gonna push us to different areas of working with, you know, different malt groups, some local monsters, um, to to bring out some of those uh, beers that that I think we would really do well and, and crush because they're not being produced enough. Um, and again, you have to turn on the beer drinker from a lactose forward uh, IPA or a pale to really understand and, and, and drink those beers. And the bigger part of that is the education piece is being able to share and educate why you chose to, to brew a Keller beer, why it's so much more um, flavor driven, grain driven, yeast driven, et cetera. So um, we're always going to be an IPA pale house, but those are some of the things that I want to showcase and over the next, I say next three years, um, you know, 10 years is a long damn time. Yeah, no, I, I, that, that was an um, unfair time frame. No, to put it, on. It, yeah. Um, but uh, those are some things I can see our team start working on, you know, as we evolve and get older. We're, none of us are getting younger. Um, that's for <laughs> certain. So, How about the evolution of sours? Yeah, you know, um, one of my, my, my biggest fans of, of sours I, I think as of late um or, or it's been for a long time is you know looking and following what jester king does um you know looking and following what uh you know um uh, cantillon and Dre fontaine does those, those are some you know some of the premier um heavy hitters out there um i i think it's still in my mind you know we have a sour brewery that we probably do about you know 400 barrels 500 barrels a year of that of that brewery um it's still really in my mind evolving um i wouldn't say trend it's it's an evolving um beer style and and a lot of younger people are gravitating towards the heavily fruited sours mm -hmm. um um you know the slushy sours things of that nature <laughs> Um, I'm an, tick, tick, I'm an tick, old school. Tick, boom. Yeah. 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 So I'm, you know, we've done a lot of that stuff too, but I, I want to take it back to some of the old school stuff, you know? Um, um, but I'm more fascinated with what's happening with wine and beer as of late. 
I think some of those are perfect combinations if they're blended correctly, um, if there's a white, the, the right grape varietal and being introduced to the the right um, uh, base beer. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they're fascinating. I think they're delicious if they're being done correctly. Um, and there's some so great examples think, out there these days. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, you know, we want to dabble a little bit of that. I think there's evolving. Um, but, uh, you know, is it a style that I'm going to go run out and buy? Um, probably not. Um, and is it a style that can sustain being on the shelf in the market, depending on the market? Yes. Depending on the market. No. Um, I, I think it, it, it should be on the draft list because again, if someone doesn't like a hoppy IPA and they love to have a fruited sour that's done correctly, more power to them. Uh, and I think the examples of some of the breweries, uh, you know, on the East coast, uh, West coast, uh, this all over the country are doing some pretty amazing stuff. Um, you know, in the Midwest, uh, you know, meaning, you know, our state, uh, you know, Indiana, I think is still evolving for us um, as a state. Um, just haven't really hit that stride yet. So, you know, I don't really have a direct answer to that, but I, I like to see it continue to push forward, um, even if we're doing them or not doing them. You know, I think that it's a beer style for uh, for a lot of people out there. But four or five hundred barrels seems like a, a pretty good sweet spot for, mm-hmm. you know, you're not trying to run the table with these and you can be thoughtful with what you're producing and what you're putting out there and you can sort of bring back. I don't know, just just some of the building blocks of the category versus, you know, just throwing in puree for the sake of throwing in puree. Right, so, you know, you're doing that. I mean, you're, you're trying to either hide something or you're, you're trying to basically give the customer, give the consumer what they want. Uh, again, I, I, I would just rather drink a, a beautifully crafted, you know, blunder um, or goes um, salt, salt forward, rich mouthfeel. Um, and drink it on a, you know, sub, you know, 80, 80 degree day. So, um, yeah. yeah, I'm with you on that. Um, so much of the beer conversation, which had been trending towards more and more online, um, but the in-person conversations were, have really been lost over the last year. Mm-hmm. Um, as you think about, Vaccines rolling out, tap rooms reopening, world slowly getting back to, you know, whatever normal is going to be. Um, are you, are you thinking about the conversations that you want to be having with consumers, with fellow brewers, like back when you're back in, in in person about how to move beer forward in a meaningful way? Absolutely, you know, from my perspective is you know the I, I still think we we have a responsibility as brewery owners to continue to educate the consumer in in a thoughtful manner um and and we started a little bit of this year before last where every friday um the executive team the brewers the ceo um, front of house manager would hang out in the brew pub for two hours, three hours, talking to consumers, finding out what they wanted from the food side, from the beer side. Um, it's easier to kind of hide from the consumer and, and be in the backgrounds or in the shadows. Um, and uh, But you're not learning anything from the consumer at that point or what they like or what they're looking for. Uh, you know, quickly, one of the things that we quickly learned um, by doing that was that um, you know, we didn't really have any freaking high chairs for kids in, in our, in our <laughs> brew pub. Um, uh, you know, we also learned that we were, um, IPA pale heavy. We didn't really have a great mix of beers, um, you know, for people coming from Chicago, Wisconsin, um, wherever. Um, but the biggest component was that, um, we, we missed the actual just, Hey man, where are you from? You know? Uh, I'm from Boston. Oh, you know, great breweries in Boston, you know, and you go down the list talking about the breweries and, and talking about what you're doing in town, learning from that customer. Um, and really, if you set the tone uh, from a customer service standpoint, and you do that well, you you can really build some loyalty from that customer, that customer base from all over the country. 
Um, instead of them saying, hey, your staff was short with us, they weren't very attentive. Um, they can go back home and say, hey, we stopped at the Smallbury in Hammond. The service was awesome. The, the customer, from a customer standpoint, we've created the best experience. And so I think that is is the conversations we want to have. How do we continue to drive the best experience possible? And on the brewery front, uh, from the brewery side is, um, how can we continue to learn from each other? And that, I think collaborations have helped us grow tremendously. Um, and it's helped us with having some points of contact for things that we would never have, have had access to. Um, and, you know, I miss that component of calling my friends up uh, or just seeing them in person uh, or, you know, walking down and just having a, a PBR and just not even talking <laughs> about beer necessarily. But just talking about, you know, the small stuff that we normally don't get a chance to talk about, you know, so. Um, How are you a Chicago guy and talking about PBR and not hams? <laughs> oh, man, you really want to have that conversation? <laughs> yeah. Come on. Let's, yeah, I absolutely do. Now that now that you've just prompted me. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I can blame a lot of people for that. So growing up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good it's the airing uh, of the grievances yeah so uh growing up as a kid uh my my aunt shortly uh dated a, a bus driver or cta bus driver and and uh he would always send us to the liquor store and get uh pbr it, it always stuck with me even through my adult life it was either going to be pbr pbr or miller high life um but i gravitate more towards pbr i think PBR or hams is owned by one another, if, if I'm correct. Probably. Um, so it's it's probably the same juice, but there's something in my mind that's beautiful about that red, white, and blue can that says everything Americana. So um, you, you'll definitely uh, find PBR in my house, my car, you know trunk of my car for a trip, uh, or just bringing it down to another brewery owner out of state and saying, hey, you know, let's have a beer, and um, it's it's, it's Americana. You gotta have PBR, man. Okay. Uh, I actually did just look it up. So PBR is obviously owned by Pabst. Hams, it looks like, is owned by Molson Coors. Molson Coors. Okay. All right. So, uh, you so you know, it's dollars going Coors to Banker. a different company as well. <laughs> yeah. It's exactly. Um, as you think about getting back into the world, and as we start to wrap up here, but as you, as you start to think about getting back into the world, I mean, you were doing a lot of collaborations, and you right. know, people were, were getting really excited about the you know the beers that that you were putting out with other folks. Is there an aspirational first collaboration post pandemic that you have in mind? Yeah, um, uh, for a lot of years now, we've been talking back and forth. Um, uh, about brewing a beer, we always see each other in, either in airport and passing, or hotel and passing, or at a beer festival. Um, and so, on my list is to brew with uh, Hannick from the Omni Polio. Nobody's going to so, be interested in that. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, I love him and I respect him. Um, he's been a, a dear friend, and uh, we just uh, every time in passing, we're we try to set something up and um, he's an extremely busy entrepreneur and, and an amazing brewer um, working on multiple projects. Um, and, and, and we're in, we're no different, you know, so we're busy with projects. And so um, as soon as things open back up, I'm going to fly into Denmark and then uh, fly over to uh, Sweden. And, and um, I'm just going to show up at his doorstep and hopefully he's not an Ethiopia, Ethiopia and, um, uh, yeah, we're gonna make an amazing beer and, and and eat pizza and 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 talk crap about what we like and what we don't like. So, um, I, I I again I love him. I respect him and 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 what Carl done and and for the beer industry. And so, um, you know, he's one of the first dudes. Uh, just I just want to wrap my arms around and just say, hey man, uh, welcome back to the world. <laughs> That's definitely something for. Uh selfishly as as drinkers all of us to look forward to so um drew thanks for taking the time and for being on the show today i appreciate you sharing your story your insight and um really for thank all that you're doing and how thoughtful you're being in the in the industry so um thank you for having me it was uh really appreciated and uh, uh not i mean I'm, I'm looking forward to uh again just 
having some sense of normalcy, I'm sure as we all are um, um, through this pandemic. So just this, as long as we remain positive and um, we'll, we'll, we'll get through it. We're, we're resilient. We're Americans. We'll get through it. Absolutely. That's Drew Fox of 18th Street Brewing in Indiana. And like he said, it's okay to not be okay. If you or someone you know is struggling these days, reach out and ask for or offer up some help. No one has to go through any of this alone, and no one wants to see anyone gone, especially you. Before we go, a reminder to check out BeerEdge.com for articles, podcasts, and the newsletter sign-up, and more. And if you want to advertise here, you can reach out to Liz Melby. She's at Liz at BeerEdge.com. You should also go to Facebook and become a part of the This Week in Roush Beer podcast page. And please don't forget to subscribe and leave a review of the show. You can also check out Steal This Beer every Monday and the BYO Nano podcast on the 15th of every month. Nate Schwaber does the music. Jeff Quinn designed the logo. I'm John Hall. New episodes of the show come out every Wednesday. And that's when I'll be back again to drink beer and to think beer.